Hello and welcome to Propdale's property video number 26. I'm your host Dale Whitman and the subject of this video is covenants running with landlords and tenants interests in the land. In other words, when a landlord or a tenant transfers their interest to the covenants that are associated with that interest, the benefits and the burdens of those covenants become binding and beneficial to the new holder of the landlord's or tenant's interest. That's the subject of this video 26. Now leases are full of covenants. A covenant, of course, is simply a promise made by one of the parties, either the landlord or the tenant, to the other one. And leases have got lots of covenants in them. For example, on the landlord's side, landlords might covenant to provide utilities, to provide trash removal, to make repairs and maintenance. And there are many, many other covenants that landlords sometimes make. On the tenant's side, tenants obviously always covenant to pay the rent but they also may make other covenants about the property. For example, how they're going to use the property, that they won't make or will only make certain kinds of modifications to the building, that they won't keep pets on the property, and many, many other matters that tenants might promise. Every covenant has both a benefit and a burden. And we're going to look at some covenants and think about which party is benefited and which party is burdened by each of them. So here's an example. Landlord enters into a lease with the tenant, and the tenant in the lease promises to paint the premises every five years. Well, who has the benefit and who has the burden there? The landlord obviously is benefited by getting his property painted by the tenant. The tenant has the burden of getting the materials and doing the painting or hiring a contractor. So the landlord has the benefit and the tenant's interest is the burdened interest. Here's another example. This time it's a covenant by the landlord. The landlord will provide weekly trash pickup service. Who has the benefit and who has the burden? Well, it's beneficial to the tenant to be able to dispose of his or her trash. So the tenant has the benefit and the landlord has the burden of paying for the trash pickup service. In another example, the tenant promises the landlord in the lease that the tenant will maintain no pets or animals on the premises. Obviously, it's a benefit to the landlord not to have to worry about pets or animals damaging the property, and it's a burden on the tenant, especially if the tenant likes dogs or cats. The tenant is restricted in what the tenant can do. And we can see here, and in this example, that sometimes covenants involve an affirmative act by the party making the covenant, and sometimes they involve a negative act, that is, promising to refrain from doing certain actions. Either kind is a perfectly valid covenant. Here's one more example. The landlord in the lease promises that the landlord will not operate a restaurant within one mile of the leased premises. The chances are the reason for that is that the tenant is going to run a restaurant and the tenant doesn't want any competition. In this example, it's obviously beneficial to the tenant to avoid competition from the landlord. And it's a burden to the landlord because the landlord might decide to run a restaurant in the vicinity and won't be able to do so because of this covenant in the lease. So the landlord's interest is burdened and the tenant's interest is benefited. Now at this point we need to introduce the concept of a covenant running with the land. And in the case of landlord-tenant covenants, we really should say running with an interest in the land because both the landlord and the tenant have different interests in the same physical piece of real property. What do we mean by a covenant running with the land? We mean that somebody who wasn't a party to the original covenant might be liable on it if the burden runs to them, they might be responsible to perform it, or if the benefit runs to them, they might be able to enforce a covenant made by the other party. That is, they might have standing to enforce it if the benefit runs. This is a unique concept of Anglo-American law. The uh, European civil law systems don't have any concept of a covenant running with an interest in the land. On the burden side, what we mean then is that a person may become liable on a contractual obligation, that is a covenant or a promise, without signing it, merely by becoming the holder of an interest in land that's associated with that contract's obligations. In other words, if you get the interest in the land, you automatically become liable on the covenants that are associated with that. The burden of those covenants would run to you. 
On the benefit side, what we mean is that a person can get standing to enforce a contractual obligation, that is, a covenant or a promise, by acquiring an interest in the land, even though they haven't any express assignment of the right to enforce it. Without anything in writing giving them the right to enforce, they automatically get it just by virtue of getting that interest in the land. So what are the issues with covenants running with the land? Well, let's take this simple case of a landlord making a lease with a tenant, and the tenant and landlord enter into a couple of covenants. There's a covenant by the tenant to pay the rent, of course, and let's say there's a covenant by the landlord to repair the property. Subsequently, the landlord might sell the property, the building, to a new landlord, we'll call him L1. When a landlord sells the building, the landlord's really selling the rents and reversion interests, as we talked about in the previous video. On the tenant side, the tenant make, might make an assignment or a sublease of the leasehold estate to a new tenant, we'll call the new tenant T1. Both the landlords and the tenants then might transfer their interests. So the question becomes this, are their successors able as plaintiffs to enforce the covenants made by the other party, the original other party? In other words, does the benefit run? For example, can L1 enforce the tenant's covenant to pay the rent? Can T1 enforce the landlord's covenant to repair the property? That's the question. Does the benefit run? On the other hand, with the burden, the question is, are the successors liable as defendants for performance of the covenants made by the original party who made the transfer to them? In other words, if L sells the building to L1, is L1 liable for L's original promise to make repairs on the property? Likewise, on the tenant side, if T transfers to T1, is T1 liable to pay the rent? That's the question. Does the burden of the covenant made by the original party transfer to his or her successors? Now, if we think rigorously about how a plaintiff can have a benefited interest in the land, we'll realize that there are actually three different ways that can happen. The first way is that the plaintiff, the person who's trying to enforce the benefit, was the original party benefited by the covenant. They entered into the covenant, so obviously they can enforce it. A second possibility is that the plaintiff acquired the property after the covenant was entered into and the benefit was expressly assigned to the plaintiff. Now notice there's a difference between assigning a leasehold, for example, as we talked about in the previous video, and assigning the benefits of the covenants. Those would be two separate concepts. And so if there is an express assignment of the benefit of the covenants to the new owner, then they can be the plaintiff. The third way that it might happen is that the plaintiff acquired the land after the covenant was entered into, and the benefit of the covenant ran with the interest that the plaintiff acquired. That's the covenant running with the land idea that we talked about on the previous slide. So there are three possible ways that a person who holds an interest in leased property might have the benefit of the covenants that the other party made. Now on the burden side, how can a defendant have a burdened interest in real property? Well, there are three ways. Once again, the defendant might have been the original party who was obligated under the covenant. If they signed the lease, for example, and the lease contained the covenant burdening them, they're obviously bound by it. Second possibility, the defendant acquired the covenant, uh, acquired the land after the covenant was entered into, and the defendant expressly assumed liability under it. We call that an assumption agreement. Now, don't assume, pardon the pun, that there's always an assumption agreement. There may or may not be. When an interest in leased property is transferred, the new party who takes an interest in it may or may not sign an assumption agreement. The third way is the covenant running with the land concept. The defendant acquired the land after the covenant was entered into, and the burden of the covenant ran with the interest that the tenant acquired, and therefore became a burden of the defendant automatically, and they're automatically bound by it, even though it, they didn't assume it, and even though they weren't the original party to it. So those are the three ways that a defendant can have a burdened interest in land that's under a lease.
Now, despite the conventional terminology about covenants running with the land, I'd urge you to be more specific and not to use that rather loose phrase. It's, it's really too vague. Instead, what you want to say is that the benefit or the burden of some specific covenant can run, and you need to specify whether you're talking about the benefit or the burden. And then you want to say it can run with some specific interest in the land that someone holds. In the case of landlord-tenant law, the landlord has the rents and reversion interest, the tenant has the leasehold interest, so you need to specify which interest in land the benefit or burden is running with. For example, you might say the burden of the tenant's covenant to pay rent runs with the tenant's leasehold estate and is binding on the tenant's assignee. That would be a true and valid statement, but you'll notice there that we have specified that it's the burden rather than the benefit of the covenant that we're concerned about. And notice that we've also said what interest in land it runs with, namely, in this case, the tenant's leasehold estate. So that's the correct way to use the terminology here. For the remainder of this video, we're going to assume either that the, the benefited or the burdened interest, or possibly both, have been transferred. So either the landlord has sold the building and transferred the uh, rents and reversion interest, or the tenant has made an assignment or sublease and transferred all or part of the leasehold estate. So there has been a transfer. We're also going to assume that there's no express contractual assumption of burdens on the burden side and no express assignment of benefits on the benefited side. Once again, notice the difference between an assignment of the leasehold estate and an assignment of the benefits of the covenants. Those are two completely separate and independent ideas, even though the word assignment refer, in, refers to both of them. One of them is a transfer of an estate, and the other is an assignment of a contractual right. So don't get them mixed up. So the question before us is always whether the benefit or the burden or, the bo or both runs with the transferred interest in the land automatically. We've eliminated the other two ways that someone can be benefited or burdened. There's, they're not the original party, and there's no assumption or assignment of the benefits or burdens, and therefore only the question that remains is, does the benefit or burden run with the transferred interest in the land, and thereby automatically inure to the new owner of that interest? What happens if the benefit or the burden runs? Well, if the benefit runs, the new holder of the interest it runs with will have standing to enforce the covenant. They can be a plaintiff, for example. If the burden runs, the new holder of the interest that it runs with will be personally liable to perform the covenant. They can be a defendant in a lawsuit, and the court will order them to perform or order them to pay damages for failure to perform. To have a successful action on a covenant, and this is of critical importance, we have to have both a defendant who's personally liable on the burden of the covenant and a plaintiff who has standing to enforce the benefit. If we don't have both of those, we don't have a viable action on the covenant. And so what that means is that if the land's been transferred, we need a defendant with a burdened interest in the land and a plaintiff with a benefited interest in the land. In landlord-tenant cases, of course, these are usually different interests in the same physical parcel of land, since the landlord and the tenant have distinct and identifiable interests in the same physical parcel. As an example of what we've just been talking about, let's consider a tenant's covenant to pay the rent. In the diagram above, L enters into a lease with T, and T promises to pay the rent. Now we're going to look at four possible situations and consider which aspect the benefit or the burden has to be shown to run with what interest in the land in order to have a successful lawsuit for the rent. In the first example, suppose neither party has transferred their interests and L sues T. In this case, we don't care whether the benefit or the burden of the covenant would run with an interest in the land at all because neither party's interest in the land has been transferred. This is really just a simple contract enforcement case. L can sue T, T because T entered into a promise to pay the rent. In the second example, suppose T makes a transfer of the leasehold estate to T1, an assignment. 
Now the landlord sues T1. What do we care about? We care about whether the burden of the covenant that the original tenant T made will run to the new tenant. So it's an issue of whether the burden runs with the burdened interest in the land, namely the tenant's leasehold estate. On the other hand, suppose T doesn't make an assignment, but L sells the building, transfers the property to L1, and now T doesn't pay the rent, and L1 sues T for the rent. Now what do we care about? We care about whether the benefit of the rent covenant, a benefit that was originally the property of L, has now run with the landlord's transfer of the rent's interest to L1, so that L1 would have standing to sue the tenant. Finally, let's suppose both parties make transfers. Suppose L, the landlord, transfers the building and therefore the rent's interest to L1, and T sells or transfers the leasehold interest to T1. Now we have to show, in order to have a successful lawsuit, that both the benefit of the rent covenant runs from L to L1, and the burden of the rent covenant runs from T to T1 with the leasehold estate. Because if both parties, new parties, don't have the relevant interests in the land and have the benefit or burden run to them, the court will have to dismiss the suit. So both the benefit and the burden have to run in this final example. Now that we have the, the concept of covenants running with interests in the land clearly in mind, it's time to talk about the actual law, the legal requirements. There are three tests that have to be met for a covenant's benefit or burden to run with an interest in the land. The first test is that the covenant must be one that touches and concerns the land. In other words, it mustn't be merely a personal covenant. It must have been entered into because some wanted to benefit and protect an interest in the land that they hold. We'll talk about that in a little while. We can say generally that some covenants do touch and concern the land and others don't. A second requirement is that the covenant must be intended to run with the land. Now the courts are very free in presuming this intent even if it's not spelled out in the covenant and many times it will be spelled out. The lease itself will spell out the intent for the covenant to run. The third requirement is privity of estate. And by privity of estate, we mean a chain of both horizontal and vertical privity. Now, I realize we haven't talked about those concepts yet. We're going to talk about that and develop it in just a minute. But suffice to say, this is usually the big issue with landlord-tenant covenants. Touch and concern is usually satisfied. Intent is nearly always satisfied. But the question of privity is the one on which many times an action for a enforcement of a covenant will founder. Now let's talk about each of those three requirements in a little more depth and see what they mean. The first requirement is that the covenant must touch and concern the land. With most lease covenants, landlords and tenants are benefited and burdened, not just in their personal capacities, but in their capacities as holders of interests in land. In other words, they entered into the covenant simply because they have an interest in the land. In the case of the landlord, the rents and reversion interest. In the case of the tenant, the leasehold interest. That's why they entered into the covenant. So we say that covenants like this touch and concern the land. Can you think of exceptions, covenants that a landlord or a tenant might enter into that would be beneficial or burdensome to them only in their personal capacities and not because they have an interest in the land? Well, it's actually pretty easy to think of covenants like that, but they're a little silly. Let's look at some examples. Suppose the landlord and tenant enter into the following covenants. It's pretty clear that they don't touch and concern the land. For example, the landlord promises to pick up the tenant's mail from the post office on each business day. Or the tenant promises to pick up the landlord's children from school on each school day. Or the landlord, who's a CPA, promises to do the tenant's income tax return each year. Or the tenant, who is a mechanic, promises to change the oil in the landlord's car every 5,000 miles. Now, those are interesting promises. They're perfectly plausible. But you might ask yourself, why would anybody 
bother putting them in a lease, they don't have anything to do with the real property. That's right. And therefore, even though parties are perfectly free to put them in a lease, they don't touch and concern the land, and therefore they won't run with the land, either benefit or burden. Now here are some other covenants that might or might not be considered to touch and concern the land. The tenant promises to carry fire insurance for a million dollars on the lease premises. Now when you first look at that, you might say, well, that has a lot to do with the land. But actually, there is a rather well-known case that says a promise by a tenant to carry fire insurance does not touch and concern the land because it doesn't directly affect the real estate itself. It's simply a contract between the tenant and a fire insurance company where the fire insurance company promises to indemnify the tenant and perhaps the landlord if there is a fire. But it doesn't directly affect what happens on the land itself. Obviously, it doesn't cause a fire or prevent a fire. It doesn't affect the physical real estate. So one might argue, and some lawyers have argued successfully, that a promise to carry fire insurance on the lease premises does not touch and concern the land. Here's another example. Landlord promises not to lease any other property in the landlord's shopping center to a Mexican restaurant. And the reason that's in the lease is because an, another Mexican restaurant would compete with the tenant's Mexican restaurant. And the tenant obviously doesn't want the competition. Now again, it's perfectly plausible to put that in a lease, but does it touch and concern the land? Well, you might say in this case it does. It directly affects what physically occurs on the land. But there's a rather well-known case decided by Justice Holmes back in the 19th century in which he said a promise not to carry on a specific business on property does not touch and concern the land. It doesn't affect the fundamental activity on the land, but merely the particular commercial activity that's going on there. Now, I don't agree with Justice Holmes on that, and there have been many cases since that have debated the issue, and I'd say the majority of the modern cases say that a covenant like that, a covenant to not run a specific type of business, does touch and concern the land, but it is still debatable. It can therefore sometimes be quite difficult and challenging to predict whether a particular covenant touches and concerns the land or not, and some covenants are ambiguous. We're not sure, perhaps, how the court in our particular state would rule on them. The second requirement for a covenant to run with the land is that there must have been intent by the parties who entered into the covenant that it do so, that it run with an interest in land. Now, often the lease is going to cover that and express that intent by boilerplate language. By boilerplate, we simply mean language that's usually put in at the end of a document that seems sort of standardized and routine and boring and often our eyes glaze over when we read it. But it actually can sometimes be important. And the particular boilerplate that you uh, would often find in a lease that would cover this situation is one that says something like this. The covenants in this lease will bind and inure to the benefit of the party's successors, heirs, and assigns. That's certainly enough to indicate that the parties intend for the covenants to run with the land and become binding and benefiting on new owners of the interests that the parties originally held. But even if that language is not there, the courts often assume that if the covenant touches and concerns the land, then the parties must have intended that it run with an interest in the land. So they'll often presume that, often they don't even spend any particular effort or space in the opinion talking about it, and intent usually isn't much of an issue. Now the third requirement is horizontal and vertical privity of estate. And the first thing we need to do is to talk about the difference between horizontal and vertical privity. You remember when we first started diagramming uh, landlord-tenant relationships, I recommended that you put the original lease in as a horizontal arrow and then transfers from the parties to their successors as vertical arrows, as you see in the example here. Well, the reason for that is it makes it easy then to identify what we mean by horizontal and vertical privity. Horizontal privity 
is privity between the original parties to the lease, between the landlord and the tenant. Either you have a horizontal privity when the lease is entered into, or you don't. And as we'll see, you do. Vertical privity, on the other hand, refers to the relationship between one of the original parties, in this case the tenant, but the same would be true on the landlord's side, and a successor tenant, such as T1, if T1 is taking an assignment. So vertical privity is the relationship between an original party and their successor. Now, the definitions of privity of estate are a little technical, but they're not hard to remember. For horizontal privity, as I said, it's a relationship that either exists or doesn't exist at the time the covenants are entered into, and the landlord-tenant relationship is always considered to be horizontal privity. So whenever we have a lease, we always have horizontal privity. It's simply not an issue. We'll learn some additional definitions of horizontal privity in a later video on covenants on fee simple land. But for landlord-tenant purposes, it's sufficient to say that between the original parties, we always have horizontal privity. Vertical privity is a totally different matter. It's a relationship between an original party to the covenants and a transferee from that party, as we've already seen. Vertical privity is satisfied only if the entire estate of a party is transferred to a new party. And what that means is, on the tenant side of the relationship, vertical privity exists only with an assignment and not with a sublease. Now that's the critical thing to remember, is that vertical privity is satisfied if we have an assignment, but it's not satisfied if we have a sublease. I have to caution you about one thing. Privity of estate is relevant only in an action at law, that is, a suit for damages. Privity of estate simply doesn't matter in an action in equity, for example, a suit for an injunction. In that situation, the court simply doesn't care whether there is privity of estate, horizontal or vertical, or not. So privity is required only in actions at law for damages for recovery of money. In the rest of this video, we're only concerned with actions to recover money. The most common of those will be a suit by the landlord against a subtenant or assignee for the rent. And th in that situation, privity, of course, is highly relevant. Now, we've been talking about uh, privity of estate, both horizontal and vertical, but there's another completely different kind of privity that is also relevant in these situations, and that's called privity of contract. By privity of contract, what we mean is simply that two parties directly entered into a contract with one another. And obviously that's true of the original landlord and the original tenant. They entered into a lease, which is a contract, and therefore they have privity of contract with each other. So let's apply these concepts to the original lease between the landlord and the tenant. In the original lease, the landlord and tenant have both privity of estate and privity of contract. They have horizontal privity of estate because they entered into a landlord-tenant relationship, and that's the very definition of uh, a horizontal privity of estate. Notice that we didn't talk about vertical privity because nobody has transferred any interest in the land yet, so vertical privity simply isn't relevant yet. In addition, the landlord and tenant have privity of contract because they entered into a contract together. So both kinds of privity exist between the original landlord and the original tenant. Now let's suppose that the original tenant enters into an assignment and assigns the tenant's entire interest in the property, the entire leasehold estate, to a new tenant, we'll call him T1. Well, privity of contract still exists between the original landlord and the original tenant. Privity of estate still exists between them as well. However, there's also now privity of a state in the vertical sense between the original tenant and T1. So we have a chain of privity of estate between the landlord and T1. That chain consists of two links, the original lease between the landlord and the tenant and the assignment between the tenant and T1. So the burdens and the benefits of the covenants that touch and concern the land will run to T1. That means that T1 can sue the landlord to require the landlord to live up to the covenants made to the original tenant in the lease. 
and the landlord can sue T1 for the rent and the other covenants that are in the lease made by the original tenant. Now let's change our situation so that T, the original tenant, makes a sublease instead of an assignment to T1. Well, things change, but some things remain the same. Both kinds of privity, both privity of estate and privity of contract, still exist between the original landlord and the original tenant. However, there's no privity of estate in the vertical sense between T and T1. The reason, of course, is that T1 doesn't, in a sublease, get the full estate that the original tenant had, and so there's no vertical privity. So there's no chain of privity of estate between the landlord and T1. That means that the burdens and the benefits of the covenants in the original lease won't run to T1. In other words, T1 won't be able to sue the landlord to get damages for the landlord's failure to perform the landlord's duties under the original lease. Likewise, the landlord won't be able to sue T1 for the rent or for any of the other covenants that were made by the original tenant. So what we're saying here is that either kind of privity, either privity of contract or a chain of privity of estate will make a party liable or burdened by the covenants in the original lease. Notice that in landlord-tenant law, the old burdened party continues to be liable after making a transfer. In this case, after T makes an assignment to T1, T is still liable to the landlord because T still has privity of contract with the landlord. The privity of contract doesn't disappear when T makes an assignment or, for that matter, a sublease. So the original benefited party of the covenants made by the original tenant may have two parties to sue. The landlord can sue T under privity of contract and T1 under privity of estate, the chain of vertical and horizontal privity. So both the old and the new parties are burdened by the covenants in the original lease, and the landlord can sue either or both of them. Let's take as an example of this principle the tenant's covenant to pay the rent. After an assignment, who's liable to the landlord for the rent? T is, of course, on the theory of privity of contract. T1 is also liable on the theory of privity of estate, a chain of horizontal and vertical privity combined. Of course, the landlord is not allowed a double recovery. In other words, the landlord can't collect the same rent twice, but the landlord can sue either or both of those parties, T or T1, and recover the rent from either of them. In an assignment, the burden of the covenant to pay rent runs with the tenant's estate to T1. You can think of the covenants running along with the assignment, or in other words, um, some, somebody once put it this way, it's like a bird on a wagon. If the wagon runs along the road and a bird perches on it, the bird travels with the wagon. In the same way, the covenants made by the original tenant become the covenants and liability of T1 by virtue of riding along with the assignment. After a sublease, who's liable to the landlord for the rent? Well, T, of course, is still liable on the theory of privity of contract. T1, however, is not liable. The reason is we don't have any chain of vertical privity and horizontal privity that would be necessary to make T1 liable. Can you think of any conduct by T1 that would make T1 liable for the rent? Well, the answer, of course, is T1 would be liable if T1 signed an assumption agreement. Now, pardon a really bad pun, but don't assume that there's an assumption by the new tenant. Sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. What we're looking for to find an assumption is simply an express promise in the assignment or the sublease by T1 to pay the rent and perform the other covenants made by the original tenant in the original lease. Sometimes you'll find that language and sometimes you won't. If there is an assumption, it makes T1 liable on a contractual basis to the landlord. In other words, the landlord becomes a third party beneficiary of the promise made by T1 to T, the original tenant. But if there's no assumption agreement and it's a sublease, T1 is not going to be liable for the rent or performance of any of the other covenants in the lease. Bottom line, who has the liability for burdens after a transfer? T remains liable under privity of contract. 
T1 becomes liable if it's an assignment. T1 does not become liable if it's a sublease, unless T1 expressly assumed the burdens in the lease. Who has standing to sue the landlord for benefits after a transfer? Well, the answers are much the same. T can no longer sue if it's an assignment, however, because the benefits are of no practical value to T. T's gotten rid of T's entire estate, so T doesn't have any use for the benefits of the covenants made by the landlord. T is simply not interested in them. T1, however, can sue the landlord if it's an assignment, but T1 can't sue if it's a sublease, again, because there's no vertical privity in a sublease. Unless, of course, T expressly assigned the benefits to T1, and if that's true, if there is an express assignment, as we talked about earlier, then T1 will get the benefits and can sue the landlord for the landlord's breaches of covenants made in the original lease. However, subtenants do have to be careful. It sounds as though, from what we've said thus far, that a subtenant doesn't have to worry about getting sued. The subtenant, for example, could decide not to pay the rent and the subtenant would be uh, basically immune from suit. But that's not quite true. It is true that subtenants are not law liable at law for damages for breaching the lease covenants, including the covenant to pay the rent. However, a subtenant is still liable to the original tenant for the rent and the other covenants that were made to the original tenant, not in the lease itself, but in the sublease. So the sublease can very well make a subtenant liable for rent. In addition, if the subtenant assumed, as we talked about a few minutes ago, the subtenant will be liable to the landlord, not on the lease, but on the assumption agreement of which the landlord is a third party beneficiary. Moreover, if the landlord experiences a material breach, such as no payment of rent, the landlord can still terminate the lease. And if the lease is terminated, the sublease will terminate right along with it. The sublease, after all, is a derivative of the original lease. So if the original lease goes away, the sublease goes away as well, and the subtenant is out on the street. Moreover, the subtenant is protected from liability by the principles that we've been talking about only in suits at law for damages. All of what we've said consists of the rules for covenants running at law. Lack of privity isn't relevant in equity. So a landlord, for example, could still enjoin the subtenant from violating the lease. Even if the landlord couldn't get damages at law, the landlord can get the equitable remedy of an injunction. Finally, a subtenant can be liable to the landlord for committing waste. The reason is simple. Waste doesn't depend on the existence of a lease at all. Waste is a tort. And therefore, if the subtenant damages the property, fails to protect it from the elements, burns it down or destroys it, that will make the subtenant liable to the landlord under the tort theory of waste. That completes our discussion of covenants running with interests in land in the landlord-tenant context. However, in our next video, number 27, we'll take up some advanced topics in this field. If you have questions or comments, email profdale01 at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.